Everyone raise your hand if you need a Bible and one of the guys can bring you a Bible. Everybody's got a Bible? Okay. Here we go. The first preacher is Brother Max. All right, turn your Bibles, if you would, to Judges chapter 6, book of Judges chapter 6 in the Old Testament. And the topic I want to preach on this evening is the unknown prophet, the unknown prophet. And there are a lot of stories, or a few stories in the Old Testament, Judges 6 being one of them, where we're given by the Bible, we're given by, by God and, and the narrator of the Bible, a story where we have a prophet, we have a man of God, but we don't know his name. We're not given his name, we're not given any details about him, and these are kind of the like incognito preachers, if you will, and, and what I want to preach on is, is not being recognized as a Christian, not being recognized for the things you do, and, and why we should be okay with that, and we're going to start here in Judges chapter 6. Look down at verse 7, Judges 6, 7, it says, And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dealt in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. So this is the first example in the Bible where we're given a story, and this is a pretty important message. This prophet, it says in verse 7, says that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, and he's given this message to the whole nation, basically saying you've turned away from God, and this is right before uh, God sends Gideon to be the judge. And notice at the end of verse 10 how it says, but ye've not obeyed my voice. So this is an important message. This is an important um, you know, uh, pro or precursor to the story of Gideon, if you will, but we don't know this prophet's name. And we're going to look at a couple more examples here tonight. Go, if you would, to 1 Kings 13. 1 Kings 13, I'm going to read you 1 Samuel 2. 1 Samuel 2.27 says you're going to 1 Kings 13. 1 Samuel 2 says, And there came a man of God unto Eli, and said to him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father? when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house. So this is another example of a man of God coming to Eli, the high priest, and rebuking him. That's an important message. But notice, none of these men, are their names aren't given. We don't know them. They're not famous tough to us. It's not like the prophet Isaiah or Elijah or Moses or, or whoever. And my first point is you don't need to be well-known. You don't need to be recognized. You don't need to have men know your name. You don't need to be recognized and, and lifted up. And look down at verse... Um, one of First Kings 13, you're there in First Kings 13, look at verse 1. This is probably the most famous story where we were given a, a story and we don't know the man of God's name. First Kings 13, 1 says, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel, and Jeroboam, that's the king of Israel, stood by the altar to burn incense, and he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. So these prophets, these prophets, all the ones we've seen, and I'm going to breeze through a couple more for you here in a second, but they all had important messages. They all had important parts in these stories. This, this story takes up this entire chapter of 1 Kings 13, and he's prophesying about Josiah, and that comes up later in 2 Kings, that prophecy is fulfilled, where Josiah, the king of Judah, does burn the bones of the high priest on this altar, and, and it's fulfilled. This is an important story, but we don't know his name. And because it's not important whether men know your name. It's not important whether you're recognized by the world, whether people know you, whether you're famous, so to speak, or even just well, well known or recognized. And I'm going to blow through a couple more um, of these examples for you. Turn if you would, you can turn to Psalm 75. Turn to Psalm 75. I'm going to read you 1 Kings 20, where we have two more examples of this, and it says, Behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel, again in 1 Kings. So, so this is another example where a prophet's coming and rebuking the king of Israel, the leader of the nation. You'd think in our day, if some pastor went to the White House and there was this big show and, and like all of these examples, you'd think we'd know that guy's name. His name would get out. But God chose not to put these men's names in the Bible why? To teach us humility, to teach us that we don't need to be recognized and be well known. And God uses, God uses pastors no matter who they are, no matter where they are. God's not limited because you're in a smaller city or because you're in a bigger city or because of your background. 
God can use a pastor regardless of the size of their church. I'm going to read you Ezekiel 2, 5 says, And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall they know that there hath been a prophet among them. So God's telling Ezekiel, he's saying, whether the nation decides to listen to you or not, and this is a great message for any preacher, whether they choose to listen to you or not, they're going to know that a, a prophet's been among them. They're going to know, and, you know, people are going to know that a prophet had been in Fresno, you know? And God has used a lot of unknown pastors in my life back, you know, growing up, who helped me grow as a Christian, and nobody knows their names. Nobody knows their names. Maybe they have a smaller church. That's not what's important. It's not important to be recognized. It's not important to be exalted or lifted up. You're, de you're there in seven, uh, Psalm 75. Look down at verse number six of Psalm 75. It says, For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. Why is it not important that we get recognized or that we get exalted? Because God's the one that promotes. God's the one that lifts up. God's the one that exalts. He's the one that gives us the, the honor that, that, that we, he knows we can handle. You know, he doesn't want us to be puffed up with pride. He doesn't want us to be exalting ourselves. God is the one that, that promotes. Look at, look at verse 7 where it says, God's the judge. He knows, he knows whether he can lift you up and, and you know, give you that, that honor, so to speak. He knows whether you can handle that promotion at work. He knows whether you know, he can set you up or whether you need to be put down for a little bit, whether he needs to humble you. Go to 1 Peter 5, and this is the perfect, perfect verse for this. God's the one that exalts. He's the one that gives us the recognition we think we deserve. You know, but it's not about whether we get it or not. It's about whether God chooses to give it to us. Look at 1 Peter 5 and verse 6. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. I love this verse. It says, humble yourself. That's the, prerequ the prerequisite to being exalted or being honored by God or, you know, you know, getting the recognition we think we deserve is to be humble and realize we don't deserve it. We don't need it. That's not what's important. And notice what it says at the end of verse 6. It says that he may exalt you in due time. God knows when is the right time. And if for some of us, that due time, that right time might be eternity. We might never get credit on this earth. You might never get the, the, the recognition or, or the, the credit that you think you deserve on this earth for being a pastor, being a good Christian, or, or the things you do in your life. You may never get that on this earth. For some of us, it might be eternity, but you know what? That's okay because it says that God may exalt us in due time. He knows when the best time is, and if the best time isn't now, then that should be fine with us. Why? Because, well, there are all these examples of these men of God in the Bible who didn't get recognized. They're preaching these amazing sermons. They're ripping face, and they're, I mean, the one in 1 Kings 13 that we read, he, he withers up the king's hand, you know, does this amazing miracle, and he's, his name isn't in the Bible. You think we deserve any more credit? You think we deserve recognition? No, God's the one that lifts us up. He's the one that gives us, uh, uh, exalts us, or promotes us, in the right time. Matthew 13, 57 says, uh, Jesus says a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And isn't that the truth that sometimes it's the people around you, the people closest to you, or the people that knew you growing up that give you the least amount of credit, that they, they don't want anything to give you this kind of recognition as a Christian or as a pastor because they knew you before. So just to wrap things up, go to Ecclesiastes 9, if you would, Ecclesiastes 9. We ought to serve God with no thought of recognition or praise for ourselves. Because God's the one that chooses who to promote, who to lift up, who to set down. And that's not, we shouldn't care about that. Nothing we do for God goes unnoticed by him and nothing will go unrewarded in eternity. Because he sees it all. Look at Ecclesiastes 9.14. It says, there was a little city and few men within it. And there, was a great, there came a great king against it and besieged it and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man. And he by his wisdom delivered the city, yet no man remembered the same poor man. This is the ultimate story in the Bible of being forgotten. This guy delivered the city. And I don't have time to, to really dive into this story, but he was forgotten. But God doesn't forget us. Even if other people don't give you the credit or the recognition you think you deserve, God does, and God will, will reward us in eternity for that. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for this opportunity to preach. I pray you bless the next preacher this evening and, and the fellowship to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Garrett. All right, go ahead and turn to John chapter 21. John chapter number 21. So the story that we're going to be looking at this evening 
It is the story Jesus at this point has risen from the dead, and his disciples have seen him. He's appeared to his disciples twice. So they've seen the risen Savior twice at this point, face to face, and so naturally they decide to go fishing. So they are fishing, and Jesus is trying to get his disciples back, and he kind of needs to shake them up a little bit. So if you look at verse 4, John chapter 21, it says, But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered, No. He's saying, Are you catching anything? And they, they said, No. This is, you're going to see, this is a mirror of, of a miracle that happened. Um, this is the second time Jesus has done this miracle to them. Verse 6, And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and they were not able to draw it in for multitude of the fishes. So this is the second time Jesus has done this miracle where he, he floods their, their net with fish. Okay, skip down to verse 10. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, 150 and 3. And notice this phrase, okay? It says, and for all there were so many, don't miss this phrase, yet was not the net broken. Yet was not the net broken. You know, this is one of those phrases I think you read in the Bible, and it stands out. It doesn't really seem to, you know, what does this have to do with the story? Um, but I do believe everything is in the Bible for a reason, and so what I want to do this evening is take, uh, apply this, this note where he floods the net with fish, but the Bible, the narrative of the Bible mentions, but the net didn't break. Okay, so the title of the sermon this evening is, Yet Was Not the Net Broken. Okay, and I want to look at something we can apply using this thought. Turn to Mark chapter 1. So a couple things to note about this miracle. Okay, one, it was a blessing. Okay, this was a good miracle. I mean, for, for men who were fishermen by trade, this was, I'm sure, their dream. I mean, this is, this is every fisherman's dream. Just, I mean, the fish are literally hopping into the boat. Um, so this was a good thing. But note that we can tell, one thing we can tell from this phrase is God knew exactly how many fish this net could hold. And so I want, let's ask ourselves this this evening. If Christ knew, or if, if Christ made sure the net would not break, and their nets were, say they, their nets were, were in a state of disrepair, would they have ended up with so many fish in their net? Well, we don't have to wonder that because Mark chapter 1 says these guys were on top of it. And when he had gone a little further thence, this is when he, he called his disciples, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who were also in the ship, what were they doing? Mending their nets. You see, these guys were professionals. These guys didn't mess around. These guys, granted, they probably never expected to catch this many fish at one time, but they kept those nets so well maintained that when it came down to it, and the, the Lord decided to flood that net with as many fish as it could take before it broke, they managed to hold 153 fish. But would this have been the case if they didn't maintain their nets? Probably not. So, okay, you say, okay, I get it, but what does this have to do with me? So in life this evening, I want, I want to get across that God wants to bless you. All blessings come from God. God wants to, so to speak, flood your net with fish. You don't have to turn there, but James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, and whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So ask yourselves this this evening. Because look, I, I hope this evening, this, this sermon is assuming you are asking for the right things in life. Okay, God, I, I pray I'm a multi-billionaire. I, I, I make me rich. Okay, you're asking for the wrong things. That's a sermon for another day. But assuming, I hope this evening you're asking for good things in life. I hope you're asking God, God, give me better opportunities or give me, help me be a better soul winner or a better Christian. Maybe you're asking for um, a better job or a better place to live or, or a spouse. Whatever you're asking for, I think sometimes in life when we don't get the things we're looking for, we can maybe think that, because look, sometimes it is true that the answer to our prayers can be no or not now. But what I want to get across this evening is if the fish symbolize the blessings in life and the net were to symbolize our ability to physically handle those blessings, then maybe it's not that God is not willing to bless us. Maybe it's not that God is not willing to flood our net with fish. But rather, our nets couldn't handle them even if he did. Maybe God, for example, you say, what am I talking about? God knows everything. God is all-knowing. Just these, these men couldn't have told you the exact amount of fish their net would hold, but Jesus could. Jesus could have told you 153, to be exact. Turn to 2 Chronicles 26. Here's what I'm talking about. Maybe God knows, or I can guarantee you God knows, hey, if I give this person this opportunity, they're going to move away from a good church. 
If I give them this opportunity, they'll become prideful and arrogant. If I give them this opportunity, they will turn from me and they, 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 will, they will not follow me and seek me like they did before. If I give them this job, they'll neglect their family or they'll neglect the responsibilities as a Christian or a husband or a father or a mother, whatever it is. Okay? Because look, in, in fact, in the Bible we see, I'll just read you this verse here, that sometimes when God gives us God's not going to give you, if God is, is, is looking out for you, he's not going to give you something he knows you can't handle. In fact, in Psalm 81, verse 11, we're, we're reading about the children of Israel, and we see that sometimes God, as a curse, will give people something they know they can't handle, something they want that they cannot handle. Psalm 81, 11 says, But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up to their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsels. God says, You know, as a curse, I gave them what they wanted, and their net broke. But we don't want that this evening, right? And the point is, it takes Christian maturity to be able to handle, to receive the blessings of God, to receive the fish, and still keep God in the center, still keep that net together. So if we want those things from God this evening, let's keep our net strong. What's a good, a good example of this? This is Solomon. This is God said, Solomon, uh, I can give you, and I wonder if God came to, to every one of us this evening and, or people in this world and said, hey, I'll give you anything you want. I wonder how many people would have asked for, for, uh, for wisdom and understanding. Psalm, uh, 2 Chronicles 1.10, God says, Solomon, what do you want? Verse 10, give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this people so th that is so great? And God said to Solomon, because this was in thine heart, and thou hast not asked for riches or wealth or honor nor the life of thine enemies, neither hast thou asked for long life, but hast asked wisdom and knowledge for thyself, that thou mayest judge my people over whom I have made thee king. Wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee, and I will give thee riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings that have been before thee, neither that shall there be any after thee have the like. God says, you know, uh, Solomon, your net is so strong, not only can it handle what you asked for, but I'm going to give you a whole lot more. What, that's, that's what we want. We want God to look at us and say, you know, your net's strong, I know you can handle it, and I'm going to give you what you asked for plus more. That's where we should strive to be as Christians. Psalm 37, uh, verse 4, because uh, we see this theme is all over the Bible, okay? Uh, Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also, him, also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. God says, hey, uh, can you delight yourself in me? Can you commit to me? Can you put me first? Then I'll give you the desires of your heart. I'll, I'll, I will bring it to pass. That's what we should strive to be this evening. One, one last verse I want to read this evening. That is it, sort of a warning about this. What if you get this mentality where you lose the ability to handle the blessings of God when your net is already full? This is the worst position to be in. I'm going to read to you, uh, 2 Chronicles 26, 16, this is a man who followed God and served God, but then he became prideful, and then he lost that ability to responsibly handle what God had given him. This is Uzziah. It says in 2 Chronicles 26, but when he was strong, when his net was full, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. So look, in closing this evening, if we want the fish in our life, if we want the blessings of God, that, there's no problem with that. God wants to bless us. But look, we need to strengthen that net. God is investing in us. Everything he gives you, he's expecting you to somehow use for the glory of God. So let's keep our net strong this evening. Let's keep God the center of our lives, and God will uh, bless us. Okay, let's uh, close in prayer. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for this theme in the Bible, God. I pray you'd help us to be responsible with what you give us and help us to... Keep you the center of our lives, God. Um, remember that everything um, at the end of the day is all about you. Um, I pray you bless the rest of the preachers that come up, God, and fill them with your Holy Spirit and help them preach with power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Trevor. All right, please turn to Acts number 17, Acts chapter number 17. Uh, the title of my sermon is, How Are My Manners? How Are My Manners? Now, the Bible obviously talks, it uh, tells us that as Christians, we should be polite, we should be neighborly, we should be, have good things coming out of our mouth uh, to our friends, to our brothers and sisters in Christ, and especially to the neighbors, to those out soul winning. 
Ephesians 4, chapter, 20, uh, chapter 4, and verse 29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Proverbs 18, 24 says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. So we should have, we see this theme in the Bible that we should be courteous, we should be polite, we should speak respectfully to especially our brothers and sisters in Christ at church, our family members, our spouses, and those kind of things. That isn't quite the type of manner that I want to talk about tonight. Uh, the, the, what I want to talk about tonight is in Acts chapter 17. If you would look down at verse 1, it says, when they, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollyanna, they came unto Thessalonica, where was the synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, notice this, as his manner was, went in unto them in three Sabbath days, reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen, and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consented, consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. Paul, as his manner was, the Bible says, Paul was always in constant soul-winning mode. He was always looking for that person that was looking for the truth. He was looking where he had an opportunity uh, to share the gospel. And this is what I would say we should have as Christians, is our default setting. Our, we should have our spiritual glasses on, if you will, and be always looking for those opportunities. Yes, we should be polite. Yes, we should be courteous. We should be friendly towards, uh, you know, neighbors that we're meeting out soul winning. But more importantly than being courteous, we need to be aware of opportunities uh, specifically for the gospel. Paul prayed for this in Ephesians uh, 6. He says, And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. That is the answer to the question that everybody has, right? When, when, do you know where you're going when you die? If it happened today, do you know what would happen to you? That's what we go out there. And that's a great prayer uh, for us as soul winners, especially, you know, sometimes you get nervous and you go up to the door and you meet somebody and, uh, you know, we've all been there too, but that's a great prayer to open our mouths boldly to make known that mystery. So this is, a, of course, why we're at a soul winning church. Uh, you know, we go out confrontational soul winning. It's not contentious. It's not being rude. It's not being, uh, you know, uh, shoving your foot in the door, but it's, it's confronting people with the gospel, with the opportunity to hear the gospel, if they want to hear it, right? Um, two things I want to point out about uh, having this soul-winning mindset, being soul-winning minded as Paul was, as his manner was. Uh, number one is that persistence overcomes resistance. Now, this is something my father-in-law used to say all the time. If you're there in Acts 17, still look down again at verse 2. It says, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and notice, three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must have suffered. It took them three weeks, three Sabbath days, whether that was just the three Saturdays that he was there or if it was the whole span of time, I'm not sure, but there was some persistence with Paul in how he was presenting the gospel to these people. And notice the, notice the reaction. Verse 4, it says, And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. You know, sometimes we have family members, we have friends, we have loved ones that, that we care about, uh, we've witnessed to them or we've, we're praying for an opportunity that they might have a softer heart, that they might be open to the gospel. Persistence overcomes resistance. You know, oftentimes we'll go out and, uh, especially when we first get saved, we, we're so excited about it and we might, you know, just blah, Bible everywhere and trying to get people saved. And, and sometimes that doesn't work. And, and some people, how many, I mean, many people in this room didn't get saved the first time they heard it. I was one of those people. I needed to hear it multiple times before I finally got saved. And so we need to make sure we understand that persistence overcomes resistance, especially with our family members. Um, keep praying. The Bible says in James 5:16, it says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If we're earnest in our prayer and we're trying to do right by God and trying to be righteous in how we live and cleaning up our lives and stuff, God's going to listen to those prayers. You know, we can pray that they have a, a, a softer heart. We can pray for opportunities that they can get the gospel. Uh, turn, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 33. So being soul-winning minded like Paul was, as his manner was, should be how our manner is as well. And obviously, persistence overcomes resistance. Keep at it. Keep praying for those family members. Ezekiel chapter number 33, we'll see the second point that I want to bring up. This is the story of the watchman. I love this part in the chapter. It talks about the watchman. There's so many great um, 
applications for soul winning. It says in verse 7, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth, and warn them from me. When I say unto the, wick the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Verse 9 says, Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. He's still going to die and pay for his own sin, but thou hast delivered thy soul. This isn't talking about the watchman's salvation, his eternal destiny, but when it says here, thou hast delivered thy soul, that brings me to the second point, is if we're soul winning minded and if we're always looking for those opportunities and we can seize those opportunities, especially with uh, loved ones or family friends that may have harder hearts towards the gospel, at least our conscience is clear. That's what he's saying about here in, in, in Ezekiel. Thou hast delivered thy soul. Your, his blood is not on your hands. You've at least warned them. You've at least given that opportunity for them to hear the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, 16, Paul says, I, uh, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. So if we don't go soul winning, I've often, often thought of that as like chastisement of God coming on our lives. And that's a clear commandment in the Bible. So if we are disobeying that command, yes, there can be chastisement. But woe is unto me could also mean your conscience will not let you forget that, right? Um, you know, talking with, uh, about soul winning, I've, I've, uh, um, I've, I've said this to other people too. Like I've, I've more often regretted not saying something than saying too much. Like if you're at the door and you get in one of those situations where it's how do I approach them or am I being too pushy or am I not being pushy enough, I've more often regretted not saying something than saying too much. And, and I think this verse in Ezekiel where it's talking about, but thou hast delivered thy soul, if we at least open our mouth and we give them opportunity and try and present the gospel to whoever, somebody at the door, our family members, our, our loved ones, at least we opened our mouth to them, gave them an opportunity, and we cleared our conscience. Uh, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll end here. So, how are my manners? Paul, as his manner was, he was always in soul winning mode. John the Baptist is another one that talks about, uh, it says in John 5, he was a burning and a shining light. That's a great uh, description of somebody to be uh, in the Bible. Matthew 5, now that John the Baptist, after Jesus was not here, he said, now ye are the light of the world. We are the light. We are the ones to give the gospel to the world in Christ's stead. The Bible says, otherwise, we are ambassadors for Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, look at verse 5. It says, who then is Paul? And who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I really like this verse a lot. It kind of highlights two things. And going in with this idea of being soul winning minded, I want to point out two things in this verse. The Lord gave to every man. So every person on this earth has somebody that God tells them is supposed to give the gospel to them, right? Maybe I didn't say that quite right, but everybody is appointed to give the gospel to somebody. So everybody, at the end of the day, everybody has the free will choice to decide to accept the gospel or to reject it, right? But in that verse also, notice the ministers, the ministers by whom they believe, they also have the free will choice to go to that door or to open their mouth or to talk to that person or not, right? So when we're out there, if we're trying to be soul winning minded like we should be, persistence overcomes resistance. We need to be persistent in our efforts to, to reach the lost with the gospel. And we need to make sure that we're doing so that we can keep our conscience and our heart right. Make sure that we have a clean conscience towards God. Because at the end of the day, when you get real, every person must choose for themselves whether to accept the gospel or not. But we also must simply do our job to warn them so that our conscience is clear as well. Uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this church. Lord, thank you for uh, the opportunity to preach. We ask that you would uh, be with the next preacher as well and, uh, and the festivities this evening. In your name we pray. Amen. Brother Luke. All right, guys. Uh, first off, you know, thanks. Thank, thank God for uh, Hold Fast Baptist Church. Thank God for Pastor and his family. Thank God for the Nutchers and their latest addition to their family. Um, I want to talk about, uh, I'm calling this, um, it's kind of a mouthful, but a quick case for biblical ethics. Okay, quick case for biblical ethics. Uh, especially 
in the workplace. So I was reading uh, Romans, Romans 12, verses uh, 10 and 11. It says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And uh, focusing on verse 11 right there, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Um, I think maybe a, a primary application for this verse in context would be the business of the ministry, like going and preaching the gospel and kind of doing that. But also I think about not being slothful in the work that you do. And, it, and the, the fact that it's in the, in the same verse we got serving the Lord, it makes me think of, um, it makes me think of uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 10, verse uh, 31. And that'd be, uh, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatever ye do, do all things, or do all to the glory of God. So, um, and also Colossians 3, Colossians 3.23 is another one. Colossians 3.23, which most of us know. 3.23, um, and, what's, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. So everything we do should be to the glory of God. Um, even in the workplace, um, uh, our work performance, our proficiency in the work that we do and whatever job you do, uh, your production level, um, just the way you carry yourself on the job site, it matters because people are going to look at the way you work. They're going to look at the way you get things done. They're going to look at the, 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 the carefulness, you t uh, the time you take and, and the craft that you do and um, they're going to see that and they're going to notice that. And they're going to look at the way you carry yourself and they're going to be like, wow, what is what is this guy got that I don't have? What is this guy thinking about that I'm not thinking about? Well, at least they should, you know, they should think that, but not everybody does. But if they think that, they might come to the point where they want to ask you for that hope that is in you. They're going to start asking you questions. Hey, you know, what what drives you? What gets you there? What, what makes you want to perform this way? Um, and, uh, and that opens the door for us to preach the gospel unto them. You know what I'm saying? It gives us the opportunity to explain to them, this is why I care. This is why, you know, because not only am I, it's not, it's not that we ourselves should want the glory for ourselves, like, you know, as Brother Max was saying, hey, it's not that I'm just some great worker and that, you know, I'm just this meticulous or whatever, but it's because, because me doing a good job is not me just serving my m earthly bosses. It's me serving the Lord. It's me giving glory to God in everything that I do, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, thinking about that, you know, the, the unsaved sometimes, and even, the, uh, even you know, wicked people, they'll, they climb these ladders in the, in the workplace, and they sometimes climb those ladders uh, through deceit, through lying, through whatever negative ways they would climb those ladders, you know what I mean? And uh, sometimes they get to the top. Sometimes they do, you know. And uh, other times, you know, they don't. And uh, and even if they climb those ladders and they get to the top, you know, God will God will abase them. You know what I mean? Even if they don't get abased on this earth in eternity, they're going to be abased. You know what I mean? But um, we we don't get to the top by being that way. You know what I mean? We're going to get chastised. We're sons and daughters of God. God's going to punish us just like we punish our children when they're messing up. You know, so God's not going to allow us to get get that way. Get get to the top that way. And um, so we should, uh, we should strive to show the people around us how they should work, how they should care about their, uh, their proficiency and their, pro uh, their production level. And through that, it'll open the door for them wanting to ask us why we do that, and then that gives us an opportunity to give them the gospel. And then uh, not only that, but um, the way you live your life is a reflection, the way you work is a reflection of, your, of how you live your life. And the way you live your life reflects the Lord God. Okay? So we don't, want, we don't want to give Jesus Christ a bad rap. We don't want to give Christianity a bad rap. There's enough people out there doing that, as is, you know what I mean? And we don't want to add to that. You know, and there's a lot of Proverbs on this topic, you know, like... Uh, Proverbs 14, 23, in all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. You know what I mean? So talk is cheap, you know, when it comes to 
your work. You know, I mean, you could talk a, a big game, but if you can't, if you if you're bent, if you're curling nails over all day, then you know no one's gonna take you seriously. No, they're gonna, hey, just take your bags off, go home, sign out. You know, what are you doing? But um, another one is Proverbs 13:4. The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be fat. So this is all over Proverbs. This is all over the Bible, Ecclesiastes. I mean, there's, there's verses all day on this. You know, I couldn't squeeze them all into here. But the overall point is show, show, your, uh, show your, your Christianity through your work just so it can open a door to, to win some more souls and to lead some more people to Jesus Christ. It's, a, it's a more of a practical sermon. But, um, and sometimes we, could, we can get discouraged when we're in the workplace and we see people around us and they're, they're sluggards, they're slothful, and we start to ask ourselves, why am I following behind this guy and cleaning up every single thing that he's doing? Why am I the one behind him and, and sorting this out? It could discourage us. It can make us kind of like, why, why do I care? You know what I mean? But we shouldn't let it uh, get us to that point. You know what I mean? Um, you should continue in your hard work. You should maintain your integrity and, um, and the quality of your work, not, not because of your own glory, not because of a promotion, you know, as, uh, as also Brother Max mentioned, you know, it's God that promotes, you know what I mean? So the, f the harder you work, God will see that, and he'll, he'll promote you. He'll help you climb that ladder the right way, you know what I mean? But, uh, you know, that's the sermon, okay? But uh, let's pray real quick. All right, uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, today, Lord. Thank you for everybody that came out today. Thank you for all the preachers that preached, and thank you for um, the preacher that's going to come up next. Thank you for the Nutcher family and the latest edition of, uh, of their family. And uh, we just pray that you will bless the rest of this evening. In Christ Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Oh, I know who this is. Benjamin. All right, so turn your Bibles to uh, Psalm 19. We'll look at Psalm 19. Um, thank you, Pastor, for this opportunity to preach, and thank the Lord for that. Uh, so the title of the sermon is Why Preach? So the sermon is mostly for the men in the, in the church. Um, it's also for people in general who just uh, haven't gone out soul winning. Maybe they're nervous. Maybe they're just not, you know, they just don't sort of have that confidence. So this is going to apply mostly for men's preaching night, but it also applies to just preaching the gospel, whether man or woman. Um, so I've been here for, I don't know, over a year, I think, at this point, And uh, don't get me wrong. I love the sermons. I'm always looking forward to different perspectives and all that, but I always, I always notice that it's the same people preaching. And, and it's great. I love listening to Brother Max's sermon, Brother Luke's sermons, and everyone's sermons, but it's always the same people preaching, and I think that needs to change, or that should change. Not, you know, not like, okay, we're going to force that to change and you need to start preaching, but I, I do know that there's people out there that want to preach, and they just they're going about it the wrong way, the way they're thinking, um, should I preach or not? And so I just want to encourage those who do want to preach to, um, you know, make it known, and, and hopefully you can preach at the next uh, men's preaching night. But I have three points here to kind of help with that. Um, so in Psalm 19, let's take a look at verse 7. Psalm 19, verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the law of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So the first point is preaching on something that you've gotten right in your life. Now, you might have gotten something right in your life that other people are struggling with. How do you know? You're not going to know because you're not, you, hopefully you're not prying and you know, digging up evil on people. But you're not going to know. So what's, you know, the best thing you can do is actually preach on something you've gotten right in your life. And some of the, the reasons why I've heard people say they don't want to preach is because maybe they haven't read the Bible cover to cover, or maybe they don't feel like they know the Bible enough. But it says right here in Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the law is sure, making wise the simple. All you need to do, if you understand what you did to get right in your life, maybe whether it's either alcohol or whether it's just some certain sin, whatever, if you know the steps that took to get you from where you were to where you are now, having um, cleansed that out of your life, all you need to do is put that in a sermon, a very simple sermon. It doesn't have to be long. It's a 10-minute sermon. Just put that in a sermon, and you don't have to be the best preacher. Figure it out. You know, take five or 10 minutes, point A, point B, point C, and go through the different verses, and that way you can help somebody get over that stumbling block that maybe you had in your life 
And um, so, because you never know what, what topic you, you preach on can actually have a huge impact on somebody in the congregation. You just won't know it right now. You might know it in heaven. You might know like a few months later or whatever when somebody actually thanks you for that. But you're just not going to know. So the first point is just preach on something you've gotten right in your life. Keep it simple. And um, that's a really good reason to preach. Uh, point number two is... Do you have a Corinthian mindset towards yourself? So turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we'll look at verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. So it says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 10, uh, this, these are the people, they had this sort of mindset towards Paul. It says, For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. So what this is saying basically is people uh, looked at Paul as a weak preacher, his word, maybe he stuttered a lot, whatever the case is, um, they saw him as his speech is contemptible. And guess what? A lot of people have that mindset towards themselves. And one thing I'm sick and tired of is, is people comparing themselves against other people. And I know this is a common thing out there for people to compare themselves against other preachers. Oh, I can't preach like, uh, you know, pastor so-and-so, and I can never be as great as him, and I can never do this like him. You have the, if you have that attitude, you need to do some maturing and understand that you're not looking at the bigger picture. The bigger picture is helping somebody else. The bigger picture is actually being a benefit and a profit to the kingdom of God. It's not about being the, you know, the greatest preacher or having like this perfect way of preaching and teaching. It's not about that. Um, if you have issues with the way you speak, well, guess what? Join the club. Um, if you stutter, if you, remember, you forget your words, if you just say things out of place, who cares? Whatever. Join the club. If you get nervous, you know, don't ever let that be an excuse um, to stop you from preaching a sermon, something that could actually greatly benefit other people. And God's standards are not our standards. So, I don't care how confident you are or how great you think, well, I can, I can um, I have a great assessment of what a good edifying preacher is. I don't care. You know what? God's standards um, are different than our standards. God is able to use people in ways that you don't think that they can be used. And the way you think is actually would be considered vanity if you have that mindset. Unless your thinking lines up with the Bible and you think, well, um, you know, my standards for what a good edifying preacher is is what the Bible says, and well, great. But if you have this, this high standard, or he has to be great at this, and he has to be eloquent, and he has to do this, and he has to do that, it's all vanity. It's garbage. All right. Um, says uh, the next point is well, I think I went, already went over that. First uh, Corinthians one. First First Corinthians one um, twenty six through twenty nine. One twenty six through twenty nine says. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to not things that are, and that no flesh, right, no flesh should glory in his presence. And you know what I like about this church? One thing I really like, and this is, don't take this the wrong way, this is one thing I really, I'm, I'm chief among these kind of people that cannot speak. I just, you know, if I ever try to explain myself, you guys know how I am, I, I just can't get the words out. But the awesome thing is, is that there's a lot of people here like that, and this church is doing awesome things for God. Amen. This church is out there preaching the gospel, just doing awesome, amazing things for the Lord. And you know what? We're not eloquent speakers. We stumble over our words a lot of the time. I do. I know for sure. If you're out with me soul winning, I often get caught up in my own words. But hey, you know what? The world despises that kind of thing. But God embraces it, and God uses it to his glory. So we can't take glory for that. I can never say I'm an eloquent speaker. I mean, this person got saved because I'm so great. Whatever. Nothing to do with that. It's because of the words of God. Nothing to do with my flesh, no matter how much I stumble over my words or whatever. It just brings more glory to God, essentially. We're base, lower. God gets all the glory. Last point is, um, yeah, point number three, it's not about you, okay? Preaching a sermon or just preaching the gospel in general, it's not about you. So preaching should be about, and this is kind of the, the, the overall point here, is preaching should be about edifying others 
and how you can contribute to the kingdom of God. It shouldn't be about, you know, looking a certain way in front of people or having certain clout with people, whatever the case is. Um, Proverbs 15.23, I'll just read it for you. It says, A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and the word spoken in due season, how good is it? I've heard so many, myself and uh, talking to other people, um, where they were like, well, I really needed to hear that sermon. I just really needed to apply that to my life. And you know what? And I've even had situations where I've talked to people about certain things in the Bible. Next day, it's being preached almost word for word, certain segments of that conversation we've had. And it just shows us that, you know what? If you actually put your insecurities aside and you put all whatever this mindset you have, this Corinthian mindset you have aside, you can help people in, in a wonderful way. Um, you never know what kind of impact one of your sermons may have on your brothers and sisters in Christ. Final verse, as uh, John 18, 6 says, as soon, as, as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. So few little words that Jesus spoke had a great impact on those people. You can do the same thing spiritually for your brothers and sisters in Christ. A 10-minute sermon, so few little words, and you can have a huge impact. So I just ask you to put your insecurities aside. Put all this Corinthian mindset, if you have that towards yourself, put it aside. It's not about you. It's about everyone else in the pulp and the congregation, not yourself. So put those insecurities aside. Understand the bigger picture. It's about everyone else and not ourselves. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for um, this opportunity to preach. And just thank you for everyone else's sermons and the edification that I got from that and we all got from them. Um, please bless the rest of our day, Father. And um, just bless our time out here in Fresno, this small church doing great things for you, Father. And let us never take that for granted. And we love you and thank you for everything you do. In Jesus' name, amen.